All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. My name is Krista Ellis. I'm the Community Programs Manager for the Florida Chapter. And I'm great, grateful to be able to provide this space and this opportunity for our mindful Parkinson's community, care partners, and people with Parkinson's disease to join us today in mindful meditation. Welcome from India. Next slide, please, Jen. So today's program is made possible by our sponsors, Acadia, Accorda Pharmaceuticals, and the Light of Day Foundation. I want to thank them for their generous support who's made this programming possible. And now I'd like to take this next moment to welcome our expert speaker, Dr. Maria Sirhua, positive psychologist, who will be leading us through our mindful experience today. Dr. Sirhua, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again. And um, thank you, Krista. Thank you, Courtney and Jen behind the scenes. Just a note to the team, there was a question in the middle of the chat from someone named Chen about phototherapy to stimulate stem cells. I'm not a medical physician, so I'm in no position to answer that, but I, I do pass that back to the team for um, a, a response to you and some guidance. So let's begin. I'm so happy that you're all familiar with the chat. Let's begin now with a bit of sort of owning up, if you will. Today's theme is mindfulness and grounded optimism. Um, this is a term that emerged at almost simultaneously in the field of medical oncology, as well as positive psychology. And I'll tell you a bit more about what that means in a minute. But first we're gonna own up to what it means to be human. I would love you to type yes or no in the chat box to the following question. In the last year or so, yes or no, have you ever found yourself jumping to a conclusion? Uh, a flood of yeses and we have one yes, of course. Second question, during the last year or so, have you ever catastrophized? Maria, could you define, explain what catastrophizing means to the group? Sure. So catastrophizing means making a mountain out of a molehill. So for example, I wake up, I have a little tension in my shoulder. I've decided that I've ripped, you know, my rotator cuff, like I've destroyed my shoulder, right? It's taking something and making it much bigger than it is and often in a fantastically negative direction. Um, one more question during the last year or so, have you taken anything personally? Has anybody ever taken anything personally? So quite a bit of yeses, a couple of noes. All the time, <laughs> says Christine. Okay, couple more. In the last year or so, have you ever let your emotions cloud your judgment? Have you let your emotions cloud your judgment? Probably, right? Okay, one more. Have you ever, um, this one's a little harder to admit to, but I, I, I'm raising my hand because I'm part of this club. Has anybody ever, um, you know, you're done something that they felt embarrassed about or, you know, didn't go very well and our, and our impulse was to blame it on someone else. Like if only, if only the ref could see the game, if only I had a better, you know, parent when I was growing up, if only I, my children were more mature, if only, right, my professor knew what she was talking about. Anybody ever, it's called externalize, we externalize, we don't take responsibility ourselves, we put it out there. If only we had better political leaders, if only blah, blah, blah. Try, I love that, try not to, but I sometimes do, right? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> less than I used to, I love that, Joe. Okay, here's the thing. What I've just described to you, this list, 
jumping to conclusions, taking things personally, catastrophizing, allowing our emotions to cloud our judgment, um, uh, externalizing. These are called common negative thought habits. They are natural, they are human. The Dalai Lama has them, Thich Nhat Hanh has them, Mother Teresa had them, Malala Yousafzai, Gandhi, everybody. It's just simply human, common negative thought habits. The issue is that under a time of stress, like loving and working with and caring for someone living with a diagnosis like Parkinson's, under sort of chronic daily stress or acute stress or unexpected change, we are more likely to be triggered into these common negative thought habits. The problem is not simply that we have a negative thought, it is that it often then triggers non-resilient behavior. So I'm gonna play with Krista for a moment because we're, we're working together on this series. Let's imagine that Krista, I, we're on a team together and I send Krista an email because I have a great new idea and I don't hear from her for three days. When you're a time of relatively low stress, I would probably think that's unusual. Krista's, you know, usually a pretty fast responder. I wonder what's going on. I might be curious about it. I might be wondering about it. But under a time of stress, I am far more likely to take it personally and jump to a conclusion. I send Krista an email with a great new idea. She does, I don't hear from her for three days. I'm in my head in what we have loosely defined as crazy town, thinking, oh my God, she doesn't like my idea. She doesn't like my idea. She doesn't want me in the team. She doesn't want me on the team. I'm not gonna be hired again. I'm not, that's it, I've already lost my job, right? <laughs> again, normal, natural responses to stress. But when we get triggered into jumping to conclusions and taking things personally and catastrophizing, it often leads to non-resilient behavior. I armor up, I defend, I isolate, I attack, I blame you know, Krista for being a terrible leader. I talk about her behind her back or I flood myself with negative feelings and thoughts about myself. It's my fault, I'm not a good enough you know, team player, et cetera. Again, this is all common, it's all normal, it's all natural. Here's how mindfulness can help. If you remember from our, our last two conversations, mindfulness creates that beautiful pause between stimulus and response. We get activated in life. Someone says something, does something, the world does something, we get triggered, we get activated. And because of our mindfulness meditation practice, we know, take a breath, return to calm, and then face the situation at hand. Now we have been working with one form of meditation, which is just called mindful pausing, where we learn to pause and return to our breath, our calm, steady, loyal breath. I'm gonna review that with you today. And then we're going to layer in a second kind of mindfulness practice, which is a guided imagery practice. The reason we want to go to a guided imagery is because we want to move toward grounded optimism. Grounded optimism is a term that emerged in positive psychology at the same time in the field of medical oncology, a very similar term called true hope was emerging. Research was done by Jerome Groupman at Mass General Hospital in Boston. He was looking for an understanding of how a physician could cultivate true hope, even when he or she had to communicate extremely difficult news. And what Dr. Groupman did was he didn't talk to his fellow doctors about it. I mean, he did, he did do that, but he much more deeply went and talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients about what it was like to receive difficult news and in the presence of that difficult news, how might a practitioner cultivate a grounded, optimistic hope? Not Disney, not fantasy, not Hollywood, but a grounded, optimistic hope. And he came up with a model of true hope, which was exactly the research-based model that was emerging in the field of positive psychology when we were considering what do we know about the most resilient people? The most resilient people live in a state that we call grounded optimism. 
Now, grounded optimism and true hope have three components to it. I know this might not be easy to see, but it's simple to understand. The first thing we need to do to move toward grounded optimism is face reality as it is, right? There's no resilience without facing reality. That's the first step. And then the second step is to build in what we call in our profession, the beautiful and, a beautiful and. So we're facing reality. Reality might be, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time walking today. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time being patient. Um, I woke up feeling really sad. I'm not sure about this vaccine. You know, doubt, worry, fear, anxiety, all of it. Face reality as it is, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain. We might be worried about our kids, our marriage, our finances, et cetera. We first have to face reality, but we don't stay there. We build in a bridge. And on the other side of the end, we want to move toward a slightly better future. Notice the action. We want to move toward a slightly better future. You see, what builds optimism, a grounded optimism or a grounded hope, is action. Is action. We, we can't deny reality. We must first face it. I don't feel well. I'm having difficult thoughts. I'm tired today. Face reality. Build in the end and move toward a slightly better future. Now, here's what's interesting about moving toward a slightly better future. The person who gets to define what a slightly better future looks like is you. I get to define my slightly better future. Krista gets to de define hers. Courtney, Francine, Mark, Hoyt, Delano, Shannon, Howard, Marsha, Miriam. Everybody gets to define their own slightly better future. That's number one. Number two, we only get there when we actually take action. And the action I wanna encourage you to take right today is a mindfulness practice. And this is a mindfulness practice where we allow our imagery to take us to that slightly better future, to inform us of what might be our next best step. So first we're going to review our sort of baseline mindfulness meditation. And we're gonna just take one minute with, with that, settle in. Just as a reminder, we'll take a few deep breaths. We'll allow our breathing to become normal and natural. We will pay attention to the rhythm of our breath. And again, you can do that by noticing the rising and falling of your chest or your belly or the sensation of the air through your nostrils, or you're simply paying attention to the rhythm in and out, in and out. And then if we get distracted, remember, by a thought, a sound, a sensation, a feeling, we simply notice the distraction and say, oh, well, and return to our breath. So we're going to practice that for a moment because that's our entree into our guided imagery. So settling in, comfortably. I'll ask you to close your eyes if you'd like or simply soften your gaze. We'll take a deep breath. And one more. And again. Now for a moment, I just invite you to allow your breath to become natural, following the rhythm of your breath as it moves in and out. And should you become distracted, you simply say, oh well, and return to breath. We'll practice for about one minute.
That's wonderful. Now I invite you to bring your attention back to this present moment. Now, if you were with us in the last two weeks, we talked about that capacity to notice that we are distracted. Say, oh well, and return to breath as providing an overarching benefit of mindfulness that we call the return, return to calm before we take our next step. Here's what we're going to layer in now. Because remember, we wanna to move toward a slightly better future. If you're having a rough morning, we wanna have a slightly better afternoon. If you're having a rough meal, we wanna have a slightly better cup of coffee or evening drink, right? You're having a difficult conversation, you wanna to move toward a slightly better moment of peace and ease and serenity. So we're going to start where we just practice again, our mindful pausing, and then we're going to layer in a guided imagery. Now I will guide you, and this is being recorded, so you don't need to memorize this. You can have access to this recording moving forward. I will guide you to imagine yourself seated somewhere that is just right for you, a place that feels comfortable, peaceful, warm. Some of us will imagine the ocean, the mountains, um, our favorite chair in the, in the garden out back, tropical forest. It, you can go anywhere in your, that's the beauty of traveling through the mind's eye, right? We can go anywhere. I'm going to ask you to imagine yourself seated someplace beautiful, just right for you today. I'll ask you to notice what you're seeing and what you're hearing what you're sensing in your mind's eye, in your imagination. And then we'll bring forward a question. What might a next better moment look like? And when you bring that question to the fore, I would like you to just allow the images to come naturally. Some of you might actually have images arise. Some of you might have a symbol arise. Some of you might just have a sense of things. Some of you might hear a word or a phrase. And some of you might have just a feeling, like a feeling of peacefulness or kindness or energy, right? All, all sort of responses are valid. So no need to edit ourselves. Now, at any point, if you become distracted, you do what you already know to do. Say, oh, well, return to breath and then return to your image. We'll spend about five or six minutes in this mindfulness practice. Again, not a long practice, something that you can fit in easily into your day. I will guide you through. Okay, so let's begin. We'll take a deep breath in. And again, and one more. Allow your breath to find its own natural rhythm. We'll just settle here for a few seconds. That's beautiful. Now I invite you to see yourself in a beautiful place, a place just right for you today. Allow your mind's eye to travel there, a place just right for you today. And as you find your place, I invite you to just sit down, center yourself comfortably. You might even lay down in your beautiful place. In this place, you are home. In this place, you are safe. And as you rest in this place, I invite you to notice what you see, Notice what you hear. 
And notice what you sense. All is well in this place. We're just resting in our beautiful place for a few moments, noticing all that we see and hear and sense. If you become distracted, simply say, oh, well, return to breath and then return to your place. And as we rest here, I invite you to bring to mind one question. What might a next better moment look like? What might a next better moment look like? Just allow the answers to arise as they will in any form an image, a thought, a sound, a sensation, a symbol. All is well. What might a next better moment look like? And I'll be quiet for two minutes so that we might enjoy our time in our beautiful place, imagining what a next better moment might look like. That's lovely. It's time now to return to the present moment, knowing that you can visit this beautiful place anytime you choose. So as it feels right, I invite you to take a deep breath and an exhale. Open your eyes. Maybe one more deep exhale. Gorgeous. Now, if you feel comfortable, maybe throw in a a word or an image, just a phrase of what your next better moment might look and feel like. And thank you. Now here's what's important to know about guided imagery meditations. If you've not done them before, it's very helpful to have a recording. So I'm very grateful to the Parkinson's Foundation and the sponsors for providing this opportunity so that you have a recording to listen to. Number one. Number two, it takes time to settle in to a place of comfort, especially if we are agitated, if we've been jumping to conclusions or taking things personally, catastrophizing. 
I'm seeing a, qu a question in the chat here. Um, someone had a, you know, a, a, a anxious text with um, a child, felt agitated after the text, mind starts racing, catastrophizing, that's normal, our minds do that. And um, at what point, the question was at what point do I start using my mindfulness practice techniques? You, you, the second you notice that you're agitated, right? The point of mindfulness is to be available to us as a tool. So this can absolutely be used to help sleep. It can be absolutely be used on the moment as soon as you notice you're agitated, except if you remember when I suggested don't use this when you're driving heavy equipment, right? Other than that, the second you start to, feel, in fact, I have been in the middle of a meeting or a conversation and said to someone, excuse me, I need to pause. I need a couple of minutes to calm down here, right? I love the responses, holding his hand. I feel so relaxed. Grandma's taking care of me. Shade, peace, ocean and Kauai. Exactly. Now, and I love, thank you, Jane, for the referral there. Uh, an app called Calm helps with sleep. Yes, a lot of people really like Calm. The point of this whole conversation today is the following. It is normal and natural for our minds to be agitated. Take things personally, catastrophize, let our emotions cloud our judgment, etc. However, resilient folk understand that, but they don't stay stuck there. They build in an and, and the and that we recommend and that I recommend everywhere, everywhere I speak is mindfulness practice because mindfulness enables us to return to calm so that we might make better choices. This guided imagery allows us to use that, act, activate that model of grounded optimism and true hope so that we can both face reality but not stay stuck in only the difficult reality, we can begin to integrate a better reality by creating a next better moment. The last thing I want to say is if during any mindfulness practice, you find yourself starting to sleep, I don't know if you guys could see, I was, my own eyes were getting heavy. Permission to sleep. Permission to sleep. It simply means that we're ready for rest. Permission to rest and recover. You might close your eyes for a few moments. You might fall asleep for a delicious nap. What would be bad about that? And no harm, no foul, going back and practicing your guided imagery a little later when you're a little bit more awake. Like with our basic mindfulness practice, our mindful pausing practice, I do recommend that you try this. Why not once a day for the next seven days and see how it begins to seed the goodness within you. One more thing. Sometimes it's hard to cognitively think our way into a better future because we're already so agitated. That's why getting calm first and imagining the better future by being in a beautiful, calm, peaceful, safe place first sort of does two things that it acknowledges our difficult feelings, our racing thoughts, and it gives them a better place to go so that we can use our imaginations for our own well-being. I'm just gonna take one more quick look into the chat. The return to now was too quick. Yeah, Brenda, feel free to stay there for much longer. Yes, 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 yes. All right, thank you all. I don't see any other questions. Thank you for posting um, my contact information. I am available to you and we will gather together again next week for our final session together. Although this series will continue, it will be my final session with you. And we'll be looking at loving kindness and generosity meditation. Krista, Courtney, Jen, thank you so much. Thanks, Maria. Always appreciate your guidance through meditation and really learning a lot more uh, techniques behind the practice of mindfulness. So I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, I'd like to share a message of the Parkinson's Foundation. Every day and in everything that we do, 
We are working to make life better for people living with Parkinson's disease, and that includes the care partners of those who are the patients of Parkinson's, the families, the experts, anyone who is a part of our Parkinson's community. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. That's advancing research toward a cure, educating and empowering our Parkinson's community. Sorry, little delay on the slides here. Good. And improving care for people with Parkinson's disease through our Center of Excellence Network. You go to our next slide. You can tune into other PD Health at Home Care Partner Summit programs this week, Wellness Wednesday and Fitness Friday. This week we are having our Care Partner Town Hall, so do please uh, sign up to attend this Wednesday's programming. And next Monday, as Dr. Sirwa alluded to, she will be joining us again on a meditation of gratitude and kindness. So please, please sign up to join us next Monday to continue cultivating your mindfulness practice. And lastly, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors for today's event, Accorda Therapeutics, Acadia, and the Light of Day Foundation. I'd like to leave you all with our contact information. You can visit us at parkinson.org or call our bilingual helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. If you prefer to write, we do have an email address. You can email helpline at parkinson.org. I thank you all for continuing to embrace the journey with Parkinson's disease, your role as a care partner, your role as a person living with PD, and for coming and joining our mindful Parkinson's community. We'll see you all next Monday.